In this episode, you will work out how an enemy runs towards you and tries to attack you. Hello, and welcome to how to create a vampire survivors clone in Godot 4, part 2. So, in this episode, we are going to be creating an enemy AI. And so, this is a really quite a simple and quick episode. So we're going to click on this plus sign to add a new scene and we're going to be clicking on other node. Now we are going to be adding a character body 2D. I'm just going to quickly rename this enemy and in this enemy we are going to be adding a sprite 2D and the enemy we're going to be adding is in our textures under enemy and I'm going to be adding an enemy called Cobalt Weak which has the same issue as our player it's got two frames of animation and I'm going to go down into animation and click on H frames 2 to make sure that it knows that it has two frames of animation and I'm just going to quickly save our enemy and I'm going to be creating a new folder called enemy to host our enemy in. Now we need to make our enemy move. I'm going to just quickly set the motion mode to floating so it knows it doesn't need to deal with gravity and I'm going to be adding a script to our enemy. Well for this I'm going to just rename this to enemy underscore cobalt underscore weak. And then I'm going to be adding our enemy to this. So I think I'm just going to create an, the script just called enemy generic. And then I'm just going to rename our enemy like that. So under this, we're just going to once again, remove all of this. And we're going to be creating a simple movement system. So unlike our player, we're going to be doing an export variable. And I'll show you what this does. Export var movement underscore speed equals 20.0. And what this does is now when we click on our player, I mean our enemy, we have a new variable which we can edit within the editor. So I can just drag and drop. I can type in something else. I'm just going to leave this at 20 for now. And now that we've done this, we are going to need a way to for our enemy to detect the player. So I'm just going to quickly save that. And the way we're going to be doing this is with a concept called groups. So I'm going to go back to our player node, which I'm just going to click right there. It's up in there. If for whatever reason you've lost this, you can just go back into the player folder and try and find the... Uh, just type in player in, in here and click on the player.tscn and you'll find it. Now, we need the player to be in a specific group. So we're going to click on player, we're going to click on node, and then we're going to click on groups. And we're just going to type in player and add. And this adds the player to the player group. And the player group is just a group that we made. I'm going to control S to save. Go back to our enemy click on the script and now we need a way for our enemy to find the player so we're going to make this an on ready variable and what an on ready variable does is I'm not entirely sure it just makes it very it just makes something very easily accessible so I'm just going to do an at on ready var player and this is going to equal a function which is going to be called get tree Get tree, just gonna open my reference script. Dot get first node. So the so the get tree is like let's say it's like a level beyond world. So the tree would be the parent of the world. You don't see it here, but it would be the parent of the world, which goes and what this does, it goes get tree, gets the first node in group, and we're gonna set our group to player. So what this does is that our enemy script is going to go into the tree. It's going to say, hey, get me the first node you can find in the group player. And that's going to be our player because our player is in the player group. 
And now we're just going to go into the physics function. So function physics. We're not going to be using delta, so I'm just going to underscore it. That's how you determine and say that, hey, I don't want to use delta. And now we are going to create a variable to get the direction that we want to move our enemy in. So var direction equals global position. Now the global position is the position of the enemy relevant to the tree. We're going to discuss this in theory time and we're going to be doing the global position direction to and we're going to be saying we want the enemy's global position and we want the direction to the player's global position dot global position so it's a vector two to another vector two we're going to be setting our velocity just like the player and this is going to be equaling direction times movement speed and then we're just going to be setting the move and slide function which let's go know that we want this enemy to move so now when we play we'll see that oh i just forgot we have to add our enemy into our world scene so let's go back we can see it's just our enemy now but when we type in enemy we can just go in there and we'll see that we have a cobalt i'm going to hold down the alt key and click on the cobalt and i'm going to move the cobalt so now i'm going to just save that and i'm going to play our project I'm going to walk down here and we should see that a cobalt is now chasing us and if we stop it is going to go inside us. Now, I want the cobalt to be insertive rather than assertive. Well, I want it to be assertive rather than insertive. So we're going to be making a couple of adjustments. Number one, I forgot about doing this last episode, but we need to add a camera to our player. So I'm just going to add a camera 2D to the player. And this is just going to determine where the viewport is. We want to set this to current to let us know that this camera 2D is the current. And now the camera should actually focus on the center of the player and move with the player. Now to prevent our enemy from being insertive rather than assertive, we need to add collision shapes. So I'm going to go into our player node and I'm going to be adding a collision shape 2D. And what this does, it allows for collisions to happen and makes it so that our cobalt cannot go inside us. So the player will need a collision shape. So there's a variety of shapes you can choose from. You've got circles, rectangles. I've used a capsule and I'm just going to hold down there and move it to sort of like the center of the player. I don't want it to cover everything. I want it to go a little bit inside, but that's all good. So that's the collision shape for the player. And I am also going to be adding a collision shape to our cobalt. I'm going to be adding that, just making this a bit small, holding down alt and moving this towards here. I'm going to control S to save. And now when we run our project, we'll have our cobalt not be able to go inside us as much, you know, give us some space. And that's actually it for the practical part of this tutorial. So position and global position are both vector two values. In the editor, you can work out what the position of an object is by going to the transform tab. The position starting point vector 2 0 x 0 y is on top of the parent of that node. If all of the parent and grandparents nodes have a position of vector 2 0 x 0 y, the position value will be equal to the global position value. However, let's say we have a node 2D as a parent for our enemies. If we move the node 2D node 100 x pixels to the right you will see that the cobalt's shift to the right but its position values remain the same 
Now, the global position value of the kobold would be the kobold's position plus its parents' node 2D's positions plus any grandparents' positions. So, when moving objects and taking positions into account, if you only care about where the enemy is in, in comparison to its parent, then feel free to use position. If you need the enemy to consider a position to something that isn't its parent, in our case this would be the player, you will want to use and compare global positions. So in this episode we added our enemy AI and gave it a very basic script with a very basic command, move towards the player. So when the game starts the enemy is going to go to the root of the scene and check for the very first instance of a node within the player group. Because the only node in this group is the player, the enemy will now know what the player is. So after that, after every physics frame, a calculation is done to compare the global position of the enemy to the player's global position. This is done with the direction2 function. The direction2 function will return another vector2 vector value, which will have a value of 1 to negative 1x and 1 to negative 1y value. If you were to plot this on a graph, this would be pointing towards a certain direction from the center. In our case, to the player. Keep in mind that the value is also normalized, so no need to add a normalized function to our direction. Refer to theory time in episode 1 for an explanation on normalization. After that, we multiply the direction vector 2 with the movement speed, and in our case, we will end up moving 20 times faster to the player. If we want to change the speed of our enemy, we can do so within our editor, rather than the script. If you want all enemy kobolds to have the same default speed, we can change the value within the enemy kobold weak scene. If we want the enemies to have a variety of speed, we can do so within our world editor and get a variety of speeds on our kobolds. I just called them kobolds for throughout the entire tutorial, didn't I? They're meant to be kobolds. Well, that's embarrassing.